Hello everyone, this is Professor Iris Miano presenting your very last lecture video. Oh, so sad. But we've come so far. We are going to talk about the meaning of probability in section 5.1. And then this will be the last uh, article of uh, material associated with this semester's course. It's also the last section associated with exam 5 material or unit 5 as we uh, sometimes call it. So here we go. Let's go ahead and define a few terms to begin. Uh, starting with the term probability. Probability is the relative frequency of outcomes of a random event run infinitely many times. So let me write that down for you. Kind of a mouthful. Uh, it's the relative frequency of outcomes of a random event run infinitely many times. Or, I mean, just to be clear, uh, it could be run some finite number of times. So I guess I'll say infinitely or a finite. many times. Okay. Um, but it just means that you can determine the probability uh, either formulaically or uh, empirically, something we're going to talk about on the very last page of, the, uh, page of this lecture, lecture notes. Okay, so within um, these events there's uh, a sample space which is defined as the group of all possible outcomes. And so what is an event? An event is considered some, all, or none of the outcomes in a sample space. Okay, um, so there's some notation that we need to get introduced to, and that is this uh, probability of events that are equally likely. Um, so the probability of events, so that's uh, why we have the P here for probability, E for events, um, occurs if there are M outcomes associated with an event, and there are N equally likely outcomes uh, from a random experiment, the probability of event E occurring is given by M over N. Again, just to be clear, N is um, in a sample space of a random experiment consists of N equally likely outcomes, and M is the number of a specific uh, collection of outcomes associated with an event. Okay. So the wording on these can be kind of tricky, so I think it's probably best to just uh, exercise a few um, examples. And the most straightforward one, I think, uh, depending on everybody's uh, background, would be rolling a six-sided die. So if you've ever played any game of chance or a board game that includes dice, um, then you know what it is. It's a cube, that uh, is, so it has six sides, and each of the six sides has um, a, a number of uh, dots uh, grooved into it uh, or yeah etched into it I'm not sure what the correct word would be but um, 
so one side has one dot etched in, another side has two dots, three dots, four dots, five dots, six dots, um, and that's all of the possible um, outcomes that could happen in rolling a die in which you read the uh, upward face uh, in order to determine the outcome of the event. So the sample space is going to be all of those different numerical possibilities. So you could roll a one, you could roll a two, a three, four, five, and six. There's no rolling a seven or a, a zero or anything like that. Those are the only possible outcomes in the event of rolling the die. So that uh, makes up the entirety of the sample space. Okay, so next we will want to find the probability of each event. Write answers as a simplified fraction as a decimal. Okay, so what is the event of rolling a three? Well, rolling a three, that's gonna be this middle-ish event right here. Out of all six of the possibilities, we will say that uh, the probability of rolling a three, so this is what the notation will look like as far as being able to exhibit this uh, scenario with some mathematical fervor, um, will be one instance out of six possibilities, okay? So the fraction version of this will be one-sixth, and if you were to put this in your calculator to get a decimal version, it would be 0 0.1, and then six is forever, but don't bother writing six is forever, just go ahead and put a bar on top of that six, which is indicating that that digit repeats forever and ever and ever. It's called a vinculum, okay? So that'll do it for part A of number two. Part B, let's say uh, we wanted to find the uh, probability of rolling an even number. Well, we want to list inside of the argument of the probability notation all possible outcomes, and that would be 2, 4, or 6. So how many outcomes do we have? 3, and there were 6 possible events total. We want to reduce that fraction, right, because it asks for a simplified fraction, and that would give us 1 half which as a decimal would be 0 0.5. Okay, part C. Let's say we were rolling a number greater than two. Notice how it says greater than and, and doesn't specify the equal to. So what are the possible outcomes that we would put inside of the pr probability argument? It would be three is greater than two, right? Also four, five, and six. So that'll be four possibilities, right? One, two, three, four um, events that are described by this scenario out of six. So that'll be two thirds, which as a decimal is 0 0.6 forever. So we use that vinculum once again. All right, moving on. So, um, some properties of probabilities. The probability of an impossible event is zero, okay? The po possibility of a sure event is one. So we're kind of uh, likening t this to, um, you know, percentages as well. You have a zero percent chance of something happening if it's impossible, and you have a 100 percent chance, aka one as a decimal, of a sure event happening. So um, then we say in this next bullet, the probability of a, an event is always between zero and one inclusive. Which is to say that, of course, zero and one, as we just outlined in these first two points, um, are possible um, probability values. Um, and also, um, another thing to note is that the sum of the probabilities of all single outcome events is always a one. If you have a, a, a single outcome event um, a list and you find that the probabilities sum up to something greater than or less than one, then that means that there has to be some sort of error in the, you know, the way that the probabilities were calculated or some such, uh, something must have gone wrong with it because all um, of the single outcome events I should sum to one for a, for a scenario. Okay, so let's entertain this example right here um, in which we have a group of 10 students 
in one class. Uh, there are two nursing majors, we'll call them N, four business majors denoted by B, one architect major denoted by A, and three undecided majors denoted by the letter U. None of the students are double majors. Assume one student is randomly selected from the group. So we want to, in doing so, find the probability of that one student being a business major. So that means we have to find P of B's value. Now remember, that's the number of outcomes that are associated with event B. So that'll be four students. And how many students were there total? There were 10 students total. So simply come up with the ratio of number of business students over number of students total in the group and reduce the fraction. So it's, uh, it's uh, conventional to uh, present the reduced fraction and also the decimal equivalent, which in this case will be 0 0.4. Okay, now let's find the probability of engineering. Wait a second. Were any of the 10 students that were mentioned engineering majors? No. So that means we have 0 out of 10 as the probability, aka just call it 0. Okay, yes. So it is possible to entertain a scenario in which um, you're trying to find the probability of something impossible happening and this is a would be a good case in point number two for this example. Next we will construct a frequency and relative frequency table. So it's been a long time since we've done these so uh, let me go ahead and um, uh, make a table and I'll make three column headers. The first one will be identifying this, the major and we'll do it just by letter and then we're going to have the frequency in the next uh, column, and then we'll have the relative frequency. Okay, so the majors, if you recall, are nursing, business, architecture, and undecided. So the nursing majors, there were two of them. The relative frequency will be that 2 over the total number of students. We'll reduce it for a 1 -fifth, And we'll report also the decimal value of it too, 0 0.2. Business majors, we just did this one. There are 4. So the relative frequency is 4 out of 10, which is 2 fifths, which is 0 0.4. The architects, there's 1. 1 out of 10 which is 0 0.1. It's already a reduced fraction. Um, the undecideds, there were three. That's a relative frequency of 3 out of 10. Already a reduced fraction. Just go ahead and report it as its decimal equivalent. And there you have it. So next we will be asked to find P of A, which is just the, uh, rel basically the relative frequency. It was 1 out of 10 which is 0 0.1, and then P of U, P U, LOL, probability of being undecided. Now, there were three undecideds out of 10 students, and that's a decimal of 0 0.3. So now we're going to be asked to find in number five the sum of all of these, uh, you know, uh, individual probabilities. P of N, if you'll uh, remember, was uh, 2 tenths or 0 0.2. P of B was 4 tenths. P of A was 1 tenth. And P of U was 3 tenths. Add them all up. Four, 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus 3 equals 10. 10 out of 10, which reduces to 1. Why does this result make sense? Because we stated earlier that the sum of the probabilities of all single outcome events is one. So as my explanation down here for number five, I will say precisely that. The sum of all um, single outcome event probabilities
is 1. We knew it would be so. All right, moving on. Let's consider uh, this a spinner picture, okay? So if you had um, this uh, circle, just a regular circle with a little spinny device on it with this uh, red arrow, and you, let's say you spun it around, and let's say you spun it around, I don't know, it doesn't matter how many times you spin it around, there's gonna be probabilities associated with landing on the one area versus the two area versus the three area. And it has everything to do with the relative area of those regions in regard to the entire circle. So let's just very quickly uh, entertain P of one, P of two, and P of three. All right, for P of one, what amount of area in regard to the entire circle is uh, the one region dedicated to? Well, it'll be 50% of that circle, right? So we could think about this as percentages first if we want to, but ultimately the customary thing is to uh, represent it as a decimal or a fraction. You also do one out of two. Okay. Then uh, for two, notice that you have a half of half of that circle dedicated uh, to the two region area. So that would be 25%, which is 0 0.25, which is 1 fourth. So here are all the different ways we could represent that uh, probability. Same goes for three. That has an equal area to two. So the probabilities of spinning into that region are exactly the same. All right, now we're gonna have a little bit of different notation, but nothing too wildly crazy. We just want to um, uh, now define uh, these probabilities in terms of a random variable. So a random variable, x, is a numerical measure of an outcome from a random experiment. So let x be the outcome of rolling a six-sided die once. Find the given probability in fraction form. Okay, so now we're saying uh, that we're going to find the probability of x equaling 2. Now that's actually no different than uh, p of 2. It's just we have a little bit of a different uh, notation going on here. Okay, so that'll be how many times can you roll a 2 out of the six possible uh, outcomes of a die? Well, that'll be 1 out of 6 times. Okay, so for number 2, Right, because x equaling 2, it only happens just the once. Now let's talk with the example 2 here. Now let's say the rolling could be 3, right? Because we have the equal to option, or it could be 2, because I, gotta, I can be less than that, or 1. So how many uh, possibilities are listed here? 3 out of the 6 total, so call it 1 half. And, you know, uh, they were only asking for the uh, fraction form of the probability, but um, whenever possible, if your fraction that you initially calculate is reducible, you should reduce it. Now here, what are all the outcomes associated with this? Being greater than or equal to 4, well, you could be 4, or 5, or 6. You don't have to list all of the possibilities in order to calculate this. You just have to consider them. And then um, note there are three possibilities for this event, six um, possibilities total. So that'll, so, you know, reduce to one half. Okay, three more examples. Let's uh, go up to number four. Now, uh, here's the possibility that um, it equals, uh, the you roll the die and it equals eight. Well, can it ever equal eight? No, so you have zero out of six possibilities, or you could just call it zero, all right? A little bit of a trick question there on number four, <laughs> lol. All right, now what are the possibilities of rolling uh, a three through a six inclusive? So you could be three, because you have the equal to option here, or four, or five, or six. So there are one, two, three, four possibilities out of six events total. That's a two thirds probability, okay? Now, uh, careful though, when your inequality um, inside the argument does not have the equal to option, you have to be strictly greater than one for this uh, instance. So x could be two, or it could be three, but it cannot be four. Notice no equal to option there. So there are only actually two possibilities out of six total, which reduces to a one third. Okay, 
So I think it's helpful to list all the possibilities in order to come up with these calculations, but you do you. All right, here is the last page of our uh, lecture notes. We're going to define three different types of probabilities, um, and they are classical, empirical, and subjective. So basically, um, classical and, and empirical are the ones that we really uh, care about in this uh, discipline. We don't much care for subjective probabilities, and you'll understand why once we formally define it. But let's for, uh, formally define classical first, which is to say that um, the value is based on like formulae. It's um, uh, based on a general understanding of the uh, scenario in question. Uh, not on a number of events. So um, to define it, I will say that it's no, there is no set number of events. Um, the value is based on formulae. Whereas contrast to that, empirical probabilities are the value is based on a set number of experiments. And lastly, subjective probabilities are uh, basing your values uh, on your opinion. <sighs> Which has really no real place in the discipline. Uh, but, you know, it, it is sometimes uh, thrown around from time to time in... Um, you know, news that you read. And uh, it's very good um, to be uh, sleuthy, <laughs> I guess I would say, in uh, regard to identifying when probabilities are subjective. Here are three examples of uh, types of uh, probability, and we want to categorize each one. Uh, there's going to be one for each of the three types that have just been defined. So here's scenario number one. After rolling an eight-sided day 1,000 times, the probability of rolling two is found to be 0 0.10. Well, the fact that uh, the number of times that the experiment was repeated was explicitly um, mentioned in this scenario tells me that this is definitely empirical. And that, that's the, the key phrase right here, is that it's something happened a certain number of times. For number two, guessing the correct answer on a multiple choice test with four possible answers is 0 0.25. Now, I know maybe you're looking at this word guessing and you're like, wait a minute, is this person guessing the probability? No, they're talking about the probability of guessing the correct answer on a multiple choice test and they are using formulae in order to come up with this value. So it just goes to show that if you're picking one value out of four possible multiple choice answers, one out of four, right, that's going to be the way that you calculate this 0 0.25, which is the decimal representation of one fourth. So this is certainly an example of classical probability. And lastly, and certainly by a process of elimination, we could probably conclude that this um, third example is going to be subjective, and that will be the case, but let's arrive there together as well. By reading through the example, it states that Jessica guesses that the probability of finding a red dress at the mall is 0 0.40. Sure, so the guess being associated with the probability is what makes this subjective. That is... A wrap, everybody. That's it for this semester. I have no new information to present to you. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this video now, and I await your um, interesting questions uh, when we meet again for class. Bye.